imports owned 50% of an affiliated company called Global Health Imports. His ownership of Xenex, his ownerships of 2256956 Alberta Limited, and his direct, indirect partial ownership of Global Health Imports were all disclosed to my office. There is no disclosed evidence that the ownership of these companies creates any conflict of interest. He complied with the rules under the Act and the Code. Considering the information that Minister Boissonneau has disclosed to the office, it appears he has complied with the requirements of the Code and the Act related to matters involving his companies, and consequently, there is no need to commence an examination. We are in the process of the usual annual review process with the Minister and will be looking at all his updated disclosures with the office. Mr. Robinson, or Pei and I are here to, to prepare, answer any question you may have regarding the compliance process of the work and how we handled the file of Mr. Boisonneau. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Commissioner. We're going to start with our first round. And just uh, for the benefit of uh, committee, I did say I was going to leave a little bit of time at the end to discuss the uh, question that was brought up at the beginning of the meeting by Mr. Baines. I am going to do that, uh, give us enough time to discuss it. Uh, Mr. Barrett, six minutes. Go ahead. This morning there were uh, revelations in global news that uh, Minister Randy Boissonneau may have been party to uh, what's been described by some as uh, wire fraud to the tune of half a million dollars. Um, as it relates to his uh, business partner, Mr. Steven Anderson. So there were text messages that were included in the media reports that detail uh, someone named Randy, um, who's not pleased with the delay of this half a million dollar wire transfer with a company out of California. And then Randy in the text messages demands a partner call with Steven Anderson. So Minister Randy Boissonneau has said today that he owns a company that owns that he he wholly owns a company that owns 50 percent um, of GHI, and Mr. Anderson, to, to his knowledge, owns the other half. Minister Boissonneau contends that he is not the Randy involved in these text messages. Having made a pronouncement uh, following a complaint that you weren't going to pursue an investigation, does the emergence of new information generally, and does the information in this article today, uh, if you've read it, um, give rise to uh, a re-examination of, of your decision? And, uh, and finally, have you, uh, have you reviewed the allegations that were uh, reported in the media this morning? Mr. Bad, like you, I read the story this morning for the very first time. It's complete news to me, never knew anything about it. It obviously raises some serious implications if, if the story is true. You heard what the minister said. The ruling that we made was based on the information that he disclosed to us, and he disclosed to us it was with regard to GHI only one thing, that he owned 50% through his numbered company. Clearly, we will look into this, and uh, if our looking into it shows that there is more to it, that there is substance to it, there, is, there may be a, a contraventions of either the Act or, the, or probably the Act, then of course we will have to look and we have, I have the capacity to self-initiate another inquiry and look into it. At, at this point in time, I am really caught by surprise. I didn't know about it until I read it this morning. I don't know this thing. I heard the minister's testimony. I think on it would be absolutely irresponsible to make a pretty much too sure decision as to what we're going to do and how. All I can do is tell you that we will look into it. Right. It, it, that's, I think that's entirely fair, sir. Uh, it's, it was... Uh, new information, um, uh, just like you, uh, we prepare to we prepare for a committee based on the information that we have in in the two hours in advance to to find that uh, that information or those allegations. It is um, uh, it, it creates a challenging environment. Um, so you you expressed that it was uh, that the allegations in it were serious and new. Um, so is it correct to understand that? Um, that Minister Boissonneau uh, 
didn't uh, previously disclose uh, that circumstance uh, to you and that you will be uh, investigating these new allegations and, and if necessary, you would self-initiate an investigation? As I said in my opening statement, we made our ruling on the basis of the information disclosed to us. He disclosed to us that he owned 50% in the area of, of GHI through his numbered company. That's all we know about GHI. All of this now is what GSI did, was involved, who, uh, who ran actually it, who this Randy is that is being mentioned, did he actually do, uh, etc. All of this is news, and as I said, it said it, all I can do is say we will look into it. I cannot make a decision on any of that because re I really have nothing more than the report by, by in which you have two from Global News and the testimony that you heard this morning from the minister. Yep, that's, uh, I, I appreciate that response. Um, I want to ask a, a, a quick question on another subject, if I may. The Auditor General re released a report this morning, and I'm not sure if your office gets those um, as well. Uh, and in it, um, there were 90 instances of undisclosed, and I think 96 instances of disclosed uh, conflicts of interest, but the 90 instances of, of undisclosed conflicts of interest uh, in matters of $76 million uh, being handed out by uh, by individuals who were appointed by the um, NDP Liberal government. Are you aware of uh, this this finding by the Auditor General? No, of course not. She, she makes her finding public today. She says, you know, we don't have, she is under confidentiality provi provisions and obligations the same as I. Having read that, et cetera, uh, as you know, we I undertook to give a ruling on uh, the conflict of interest of Madame Shervashuren and Mr. Winmet before August 1st, and I will do so. And clearly, we will deal with conflict of interest there. I don't know who, what who, these conflict of interests are that she refers to. Uh, I haven't read the report either. Just like you, this morning it came out, and I managed to read the executive summary. So, yeah, I, I, yeah. I really don't want to speak any further about it because I, maybe there's something in the report that will illuminate some of this point. It's very troubling to hear that there, is, there has been that much conflict of interest. And obviously that's an area that concerns us primarily. And while she is more or less, as an auditor general, she's looking at the whole, whole upper operations, Thank you, Commissioner. the effect, the value for money, et cetera. So there's a different focus that she has than we have. Thank you, Mr. Barrett. Mr. Commissioner, uh, Mr. Housefather, I have you for six minutes. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chair. Um, Commissioner, thank you for being here, as, as always. Um, do you remember anything momentous that happened on September the 8th, 2022, Commissioner? No, no sir. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> well, no, I, it was striking to me because I was reading this text that was ostensibly sent on September the 8th, 2022 from somebody named Randy. It's 1314 MST and 1514 EST. We all know the rest of the text. And something struck me that that date was very familiar. And I looked back and I remember that was the date that Queen Elizabeth II died. And then I remember that that was the date that there was a cabinet retreat in Vancouver because all of the members of cabinet were wondering what they could wear, whether they had black or not in their, in their wardrobes. And so one of the things that everybody is pointing out and was earlier pointing out in this text that they were talking about Eastern Standard Time, but Mr. Boissano on September the 8th, 2022 was actually at a cabinet retreat in Vancouver um, on Pacific Standard Time and busy in a cabinet retreat um, which would lead me to believe that the idea that he was leaving a cabinet retreat to deal with an issue like this strikes me as even more fanciful. Um, Commissioner, you would acknowledge, I'm sure, that this is something, that is, as you said, you're going to look into, but the fact that there's a text from somebody ostensibly named Randy doesn't immediately lead you to a conclusion that this Randy is Minister Boissonneau, does it? I deal with facts, not with allegations of, or assumptions or conjectures, etc. And you know, I don't know what, who the author of this article is, what, what knowledge she has of the fact, etc. When we look into it, we will state the facts as we find them. Thank you. I, I think that's exactly the right way to do it, rather than conducting meetings that make allegations with no basic knowledge of actually what happened. So thank you, Commissioner. Can I also ask? 
you apply the ethics guidelines. I know as a parliamentary secretary, I, I fill out forums, I work with your office, so does ministers. Um, and you will ask questions when you believe something on our forums is not exact or is not detailed enough, and, and, and you will form then your own conclusions, correct? Well, absolutely. I mean, as you know, if each one of you gets appointed a personal counselor who then looks at your, your disclosures and asks questions and, and, and tries to make sure that it, it's understandable, everything is there, nothing is left out, nothing is overlooked, and basically guides you to make a complete uh, disclosure. And uh, that it's an ongoing process, and uh, you, you know you, you basically have an have a ongoing conversation with that person, especially since you also have the obligation to update the information should there be a, a change. So, uh, hopefully, through that change, uh, through that relationship between the councillor and the and the elected or appointed official, you know, of, we make sure that all relevant facts are pre pre presented and to the extent that the law requires it, they're being will be disclosed and put on the public record. And agreed. And they, and they find that that iterative conversation with the right. councillor is incredibly helpful in making sure that on, on both sides there's clarity and you avoid ever having a conflict or being perceived to, ha to have a conflict. One of the things that's been raised is the issue of money is being paid from a company to, to allegedly to the minister after the fact of, of, of assuming cabinet. Um, you are, of course, yeah. familiar with the concept of closing a deal while you're with a company and thereafter obtaining money that was due under the initial contract into the company, even though you're not working any longer for the company. Is that something that's a process that's understood under the Act and, and recognized and that could be worked through with the councillor? If there is a payment that, in effect, you earned prior to being elected and has not been paid, that becomes an outstanding debt which you're entitled to collect and it's not in violation of any part of the Act. And at times, that time is uncertain because it's based on you know, actual sales being made after the fact. Yeah, so or, may, or maybe become a, 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 a certain event has to happen, or a certain a thing has to be achieved before the amount becomes due. But still, if that amount event happens subsequent to your election, it still becomes, if at that point in time, in effect, in a debt outstanding with it, which you're entitled to collect. Right. So there's a lot of things that, you know, you can use words to distort the actual facts of what happened and make look bad when actually they're perfectly normal and covered under the disclosure forms and the Ethics Act. And, and I think, unfortunately, this is one of those cases where there's an attempt to um, make something look unkosher when it actually may very well be kosher. And I trust you, Commissioner, will be the right person to look at that. So thank you very much. And I'll, if you have anything else to say, otherwise I'll turn the time back. OK, uh, Commissioner, uh, we've got 40 seconds. Do you have anything you want to add to that? No, I, all I can say that the documentation that was disclosed to us in, and shows that there's an outstanding amount owed, owed to uh, Mr. Barzano for works that he pre con uh, conducted prior to being elected, and that was being paid to his company subsequently to his election. Okay. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. And just uh, again for the benefit of members, the lights were going off. It wasn't a vote, it was a quorum call, so we just uh, checked on that. Uh, Monsieur Fortin, vous avez six minutes, s'il vous plaît. You have six minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner, for being with us today. I heard your testimony, and I heard Mr. Boissonneau's as well. And you listened to him, and everything seemed to be compliant. But you are surprised, as are we all, after reading this morning's article. It is too soon to comment on such an article, we'll have to verify the facts. I imagine that's what your office will do before you comment. But I have more general questions on the work of your office. The ethics, or rather, we, are, we often have strict requirements for the ethics commission, especially regarding government members, and I think that we are right in having these strict requirements. 
a member of the government should go above and beyond for anything regarding ethics. And I believe that your reputation is excellent and that you do great work. That said, I would like to know, do you believe that the tools that you have at your disposal currently allow you to do reliable work or should there be improvements to the legislation to allow you to do a more in-depth assessment? Answer. The tools that we have for the disclosure of information, I believe these tools are sufficient. We can start an investigation. We can ask someone to testify. We have we have the power to insist. To require someone to speak under oath. and not only the person, but other people who might be implicated. I believe that we can have access to all the necessary facts. The legislation dates back about 30 years, and there are certain provisions that are hard to implement, but for investigations, the tools are adequate. Okay, so you think it is sufficient, but the reliability that we're requiring, is it enough? Do you feel like you're asked to do too much in your investigations? Or do you feel like you would like to go further, dig deeper? Or do you believe that your investigations are reliable enough? Well, we need to start with the goal. What's our goal? As I said, we're not trying to find guilty persons. We want to facilitate interactions between the private and public domain. An elected official or an appointed official has probably made investments and we want to find solutions so that they declare what needs to be declared, what they can have, what they can't have. Now, if there, is suspicion, if there are suspicions or if there are allegations or that something is hidden, well, at that time, I can start an investigation and I have the tools at my disposal to see what the situation is. And if there's a violation, then I will share this information to the public, to the Prime Minister, the Speaker of the House. Investigations are on cases that are not compliant. We want to help elected officials to avoid conflict of interests. Conflicts of interest. And the reliability that we're asking of you seems to be enough. Yes. During your mandate, not only in this affair with Randy Boissonneau, but other affairs, do you believe that you are facing any pressure from the government or others that may seek to sway you in one way or another? No. There is no pressure being put on the office. Most respect the neutrality of the office. 
what we do is confidential and objective. To my knowledge, there has never been a case where someone has tried to influence our objectivity. Thank you, von, Mr. von Finkenstein. I would like to thank you for answering my questions in French. I greatly appreciate that. Thank you. The commissioner, is... the commissioner can speak French. We have uh, noticed that experience in the past. Six minutes. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, Mr. Commissioner, you may have, first of all, I'll just ask, I don't want to leave. Um, were you able to watch the last round of questioning? Yes. With Mr. Bosino here? Yes, I was. Would, would you be, um, would you recall my exchange with him about listing of companies, the numbered company versus the operating as? Yes, 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 yes. I, you ask him to do that and I understand, understand he undertook to furnish that, such a list. Well, we hope he will. Um, my question through to you is that when, when disclosures are made, what are the requirements? If a company is a numbered company, is it required to disclose who it's operating as in order to provide public disclosure? Well, the disclosure is very simple. You, want, you can own a comp company. You can have an interest in it. That's no problem. You can't run a company if you are elected sure. and you are your appointed minister. The, the, purpose of, the, the purpose of the disclosures, if I could, sir, is to identify to uh, the public who the beneficial owners are, are of companies. It is, it is my suggestion that numbered companies that do not uh, actually list who they're operating as obscures the beneficial ownership, would it not? Why would it? Is it numbered company obscuring official ownership any more than a, than a non-numbered company. I don't, I'm sorry, I don't get well, Because, point. for instance, if, if a, there's a numbered company operating as the Nevis Group, and the Nevis Group is the one who's listed as the contractors, but on the disclosures it only shows the numbered company, then, then an average person would assume objectively that they couldn't make the connection between the numbered company and, and the operating company, the, na the, named, the new named operating company. The disclosure is not made for the average person, first of all, it's made for the office, right? And only the, the, the portions that have to be disclosed and put on the public record, we put on the public record. Obviously, if you have a numbered company which also operates under a name, it would be appropriate to disclose both. You know, to, to say, if, you, if you don't do that, as I mentioned before, each person who's appointed gets a counselor to advise him on, and if the councillor would certainly ask you, say you, you own 3509 Limited. Does this company have uh, uh, operate under a, a trading name or not? And that would be the, uh, disclosed. Is so, that part of the standard questions that, are, that advisors would provide to cabinet ministers? I would hope so. I can't, can't tell you. you know, I have 53 people working for me. I don't know whether they all do that, but they should. I mean, clearly. Could you, it, could it, you it, please it, report back to this committee, sir? about what questions are required for disclosure for cabinet ministers? Because for me, I'll state to you, it is a material non-disclosure to omit who your operating name is when it comes to procurement. Now, the crux of a conflict of interest, as we've talked many times, sir, you and I, about not just the actual conflict, but the perceived conflict. And when there are instances where there's reporting that demonstrates that there's a minister, a cabinet minister, who is receiving contracts through a numbered company in a deferred payment arrangement uh, when the actual procurement happens with an operating name other than the numbered company, to me, sir, that would, that would erode and undermine the public trust when it comes to open and transparent procurement practices related to companies connected to ministers. Well, first of all, uh, Lynn, do you want to answer his questions regarding what council, uh, questions councillors put rega uh, regarding numbered companies? Uh, so essentially, uh, when, we, when the office is informed of, uh, of, of, com of a private company or uh, any other company, uh, the requirement to disclose either 
the numbered company or the <coughs> registered company name or the corporation's le legal name, its trade name. It doesn't matter right now at, at this uh, present time whether they report one, both, or uh, or 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 not or the, just strictly the numbered company. So in those cases, uh, we will go back to the um, minister or reporting public office holder asking whether or not there is um, uh, an operating name, of what comp the, if the company is operating under a legal name or another name. And if we do have that name, then we will pu make it public. But there is no requirement to disclose either the numbered company or the operating company's name. One or the other is uh, perfectly uh, acceptable under under the Act and under the Code as well. Um, acceptable under the Act and the Code, but I think it's fair to say in this instance it presents a bit of a problem in terms of what the public confidence is relating to uh, the ability to track you know, procurement contracts that are material in nature. We're talking, you know, big, big contracts here. And so I would ask you, is it a recommendation that perhaps this committee recommend that all disclosures of numbered companies include the operating and trade names to provide greater transparency and accountability to the public and your office, quite frankly, because as was identified, you can only investigate what is submitted to you. So if you're submitted a numbered company and you're looking for contradictions or conflicts within the act and you don't know what the, the operating name is, would that not provide a significant investigative gap between your ability to, to uh, confirm or uh, perhaps investigate any potential conflicts? Mr. Green, we have, I set the rules for, for what the councillors ask, and we can really clearly establish if, uh, that you know, where the numbered company is involved, there has to be a follow-up question as to whether it has a trade name or not, and if so, that has to be disclosed. I mean, I've, we're not trying to hide anything. I'm not trying to help anybody to hide anything. So, no. it's something that we can easily just to be clear, that's not my assertion. I'm not suggesting you. No, 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 I'm no, 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 no. I understand, but I just wanted you to well, understand. That's we're at the end of the uh, this, time. We're talking about internal procedures here. This is okay. something very easily to, can be achieved. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, that concludes our first round. We're going to go to. Five-minute rounds. So I'm going to start with Mr. Kirk. Go ahead. Thanks very much, Commissioner, and thank you uh, for for coming back to to the committee. Um, the the one of the challenges I think we have here is that um, there's questions about who this Randy is. Um, you've mentioned those questions. I know that was uh, uh, certainly the conclusion of of the last round. That is still an outstanding question. Um, I. I would just ask, though, that uh, um, it seems to me that in these, this question about who is Randy, if the principals involved in this company and they exchange accordingly, a thought that they were in fact referring to a minister of the crown, even if that minister wasn't involved in that, and there was benefit derived from that, is there some ethical challenges that you would have with that? The task of the office is to ensure there's no conflict of interest and to avoid conflict, you know, to help people avoid conflict of interest. In the situation that you mentioned, the question is, is there a conflict of interest here somewhere? Is there, you know, is there if there's this exchange using the name of Randy, you know, does that by itself create a conflict of interest? No. That if, the, if the Randy is a minister and he is actually involved in running a, a company, or is it, so then of course it's a totally different issue. And if he benefited from the perception that he was the one that was passing along that message, would that constitute a conflict? You know, it's, 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 it's with all of these hypotheticals, it depends yeah. very much on the facts. And I, you know, without having the, the total facts, I'm, I'm not, can't answer your question. Well, I appreciate that, and I think that emphasizes uh, the fact that we need all the facts involved here because yeah. there are many outstanding questions. Um, and uh, just curious, Commissioner, did you have a chance to refer the defu or your office review the deferred compensation agreement uh, that that Minister Boissonneau? Uh, uh, received as a result of work that he didn't do well as a minister. Did, did your office have a chance to review that? I don't think it was a deferred compensation. It was a, 
a, a amount of service that he rendered for which he had not been paid. Did we actually, uh, did, uh, Lynn, do you know the details of this? Um, I can only confirm that we saw the information of what is owed from the, from the numbered comp from Navis to the numbered company, um, but we did not review an agreement per se. Okay. Well, I appreciate that. Well, look, uh, thank you, Commissioner, and I know you're always willing to come before this committee, and I do appreciate that because it's, it's, uh, um, it's appreciated. And, and as we get more facts, I know that you and your office will be hard at work looking at that information. But because, Mr. Chair, there, it's clear that there is uh, some outstanding information that is required in order for us to be able to effectively evaluate this, uh, the, whether it's the question about who is this Randy or whether it's the whole series of, of, uh, of challenges associated with what we've been, uh, 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 this committee has agreed to study here today. I would move, an emotion, move a motion and I hope that uh, there would be support uh, for what even the Liberals have suggested that we need, and that is to find out the facts. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I hope that we can find agreement uh, amongst this committee for the following motion. Uh, that in light of today's media reports and Minister Randy Boissonneau's testimony, the committee call on Stephen Anderson, Kristen Poon, and representatives of the Gowrie Group to appear before the committee individually and testify forthwith for, le for no less than one hour each on or before June 20th, and the, the committee seek additional resources to facilitate these meetings if needed. And then, Chair, um, I would just make a brief comment on the motion. Just, uh, let, me, let me just stop you there. Has, has, have you circulated that motion to the clerk, uh, Mr. Couric? It's yeah. on its way. Okay. Um, so the, uh, the motion is in order, um, and I'll give you the floor for some brief comments. I'm going to uh, ask the clerk to circulate that as soon as she gets it. Go ahead, uh, Mr. Kirk. Thanks very much, Chair, and I hope that there's agreement because certainly what the Liberals have suggested, um, while making some pretty outlandish accusations about, uh, and, and quite frankly, the Minister's uh, conduct was, I've never seen a Minister be so partisan before a committee than what Minister Boissonneau was this morning. And certainly there's concern about that, but you'll note in this motion, Chair, that it is, uh, we are not calling back the Minister. We want to get the facts. We want to ensure that Canadians can find out exactly what happened. So uh, certainly if there is further information that requires the minister to be recalled, I would hope that we could find agreement amongst the committee. Uh, it's it's, it's uh, uh, that, that, that this is simply to further ensure that Canadians are in fact getting the answers that are deserved when it comes to this matter. And I know Mr. Green as well had mentioned that there's some follow-up needed and I know that, uh, that the commissioner is always uh, very willing to work with this committee. So with that chair, I would simply conclude my remarks by by hoping that all members of this committee would support uh, the, 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 the simple request to get to the bottom of the very clear and outstanding questions that come about as a result of the discussion that we've had here today. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mr. Kirk. The uh, motion has been moved. I, I do see your hand, Mr. Green, and then I've got Ms. Damoff's hand on the motion. Commissioner, I'm just going to ask that you, you hang on for a few minutes until we, uh, till we deal with this. Uh, the the mo okay. Uh, the motion is in English only, so I am going to uh, suspend for a few minutes uh, while we're able to distribute that dans les deux langues officielles, Monsieur Fortin. In both official languages, we're going to suspend for a few minutes, just for a few minutes.
back from suspension uh, just to advise all members that the motion has been shared uh, dans les deux langues officielles. Uh, we have a motion that has been moved. Uh, I'm going to advise the committee members as well because I know the question of resources came up. We have until 1.30. 1.30 is the hard stop, okay? Uh, Monsieur Fortin, uh, oui. un appel de règlement? Oui, en fait, je vous demanderai, Monsieur le Président, de suspendre. Yes, I would like for us to suspend five minutes so that I can talk about the motion with Mr. Villemur, who is not currently here. I believe that it's an important motion. We just received it. I would like to be able to take the time to examine it. Just five minutes, please. I'll give five minutes, and we'll come back after that, and I'll give the floor to Mr. Green. Merci.
some time uh, to uh, look at the motion. Um, when we left, uh, the motion had been moved by Mr. Carrick. Everybody has the motion at this point. We are resuming debate on the motion. I have Mr. Green followed by Ms. Damoff. Mr. Green, go ahead, sir. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. And you'll note in the past, I've, as an opposition member of this committee, supported uh, deeper dives into uh, government dealings. I certainly support a greater um, inspection into what's happened here and a better understanding and, and a request for uh, having these witnesses to me make sense. But what I will tell you is one of the biggest frustrations I've had with this committee is when, um, and it's happened in the past, where you yourself, sir, have booked meetings uh, without consulting the other parties, and I would reference the Bloc uh, and the NDP or, or even the Liberal side when it comes to the committee work. And so I, while I'm supportive of this motion, what I'm not supportive of is the caveat that says um, that the committee seek additional resources to facilitate these meetings if necessary. To me, uh, having learned from past mistakes, I'm going to go on the record and say I am no longer in support of, uh, of a committee structure that allows a, ch a chair or the official opposition to direct the course of our work without consultations of the other parties. So for that reason, I'm going to put an amendment on this and I'm going to move that we strike after it says um, forth with and no less than we strike from there forward and we put in for one two hour regularly scheduled meeting for one two hour regular scheduled meeting and the reason why i do that is because i think that we can have all of the witnesses arrive provide testimony with five minute openings, have the ability to, to question and examine and cross examine and only use one regularly scheduled meeting. So we're not in a scenario where you all are booking meetings uh, without consulting the other parties kind of at your, at your convenience and your will. So that is the amendment that I put. I'm in support of pursuing this, um, but I'm not going to just give you the ability to do it kind of, uh, at your own uh, leisure or prioritization. All right. Uh, thank you uh, for that, uh, Mr. Green. So just so that I'm clear, uh, your, your move test uh, for one two-hour regularly scheduled meeting, and I assume that you are keeping before June 20th, correct? Um, I mean, I just need, you know, I, I think, Mr. Chair, what needs to happen at this committee is we need to have a subcommittee that plans work in accordance with the courtesy of including the other parties on the work schedule. And so if we have a subcommittee that plans the work and this is prioritized by way of a regular motion that, that is directed by committee, then yes, it would be before that. But w what I do not want to do is give you the ability to determine when that's going to be without consultation to us. I would state, you know, the obvious, which is that we're 25 members in our caucus uh, without the infinite resources that both the government and the official opposition have. So we have to take our scheduling and our timing and our staffing into account when, when we make commitments for additional work. And this notion that when we don't concede to the whim of you as the chair, that we're somehow complicit in a cover-up is, is a cockamamie way of, of, of you know, um, impugning what, what our work is here as New Democrats. And we even heard it today when with this, these ridiculous references of an NDP Liberal government. I'm not on for that. Um, but what I am on for is holding this government accountable. And what I am on for is using the traditional courtesy of our committee to have a planning committee that allows the committee to direct the work and not just the Conservative Party or you, sir, as chair. Thank you. Um, so we do have an amendment on the amendment. Uh, any discussion on the amendment? Uh, go ahead, Ms. Damoff. Thank you, on, chair. On the amendment. Yes, I know. Um, Thank you, Chair. And I would just say that we have the Commissioner here right now, and I know that it was very important to the committee that he be brought before the, the, uh, the committee to offer testimony, and instead we've been sidetracked. Um, he's already said that he's going to be looking into what he read in the newspaper, and so I think we should let him do his work, and so therefore I move to adjourn debate. Okay. So we have a... Uh we have a um, motion to adjourn debate on the motion amended by or 
the proposed amended amendment by Mr. Green. Uh, there's no discussion on adjourning the debate on this motion, so uh, do I have consensus? I'll, I'll ask for consensus. No? Okay. Uh, so we're going to go to a re recorded vote. Uh, Madam Clerk, on the uh, motion by Ms. Damoff to adjourn debate. Go ahead, please. Mr. Baines. Yes. Ms. Damoff. Yes. Mr. Fisher. Yes. Mr. Longfield. Yes. Mr. McKinnon. Yes. Mr. Brett. No. Mr. Brock. No. Mr. Curick. No. Monsieur Fortin. Oui. Mr. Green. No. Yeas six pour six, nays four contre quatre. Okay, so uh, the uh, the uh, motion carries us to adjourn debate. So we are adjourning debate. We're returning to our next line of questioning. Uh, Mr. Kirk, uh, your time was concluded. Just so just a point of order, Chair. Uh, on what's the point of order, Mr. Kirk? So so adjourn debate now. Now just for clarification, uh, a motion to adjourn debate on the. Uh, amendment to the motion. So does that adjourn debate on the entire debate on the motion? That's correct. Or simply the amendment that was being debated? It, 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 is, it is to adjourn debate on the entire motion, including the proposed amendment. Now, a member can resume debate at any time in a future meeting that they have the floor on this matter, and we would continue on that, on the amendment as proposed by Mr. Green. Um, and then, of course, uh, the floor would be open for uh, interventions at that point. Okay, so that's, uh, does that clear it up? Okay, I have, uh, so we're continuing again with the commissioner. I have uh, Mr. Baines for five minutes. Go ahead, sir. Just keep in mind, uh, we've got till 1.30, and I'm going to need a little bit of time here for discussion on, on the issue that Mr. Baines brought up at the beginning of the meeting. Mr. Baines, go ahead for five. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and uh, again, uh, thank you. For your patience, uh, Commissioner and, and uh, Director, uh, thank you for joining us today. C can you please um, explain the difference between what a minister has to dis disclose um, in their disclosures um, versus a member of parliament? Is there more scrutiny for either or? Yes, I mean, the <clears throat> member of parliament has to comply with the code, right, which, says, uh, which sets out what, can, what you can, can do, what you can't do. Big exception which you have discussed at one point in time, for instance, was sponsored travel. There's no prohibition against sponsored travel for members of parliament. parliament. However, if once you become a, secretary, a parliamentary secretary or minister, yes, you have to live up to the act. And the act specifically specifies various things that you can or cannot do. One of them is, for instance, you cannot operate a company, you can't be involved in a company, you can own it, but you can't operate it. Another one is extensive pro pro provisions against gifts, uh, pro pro provisions uh, that uh, controlled assets, what you may own or what you may not own or what you have to put in line tasks. So it's, it's a very complex uh, uh, set of regulations that are, are applied to what we call re uh, reporting public office holders, i.e. ministers and uh, and secretaries of states, and, and basically OIC appointments. That's if much more stringent, much more limiting than people who are elected at House of Commons. They obviously have to avoid conflict of interest, they have to recuse themselves, etc. But there's all sorts of outside activities that as a member of parliament you can do, which you can't do as a minister. Do you believe the your office has done enough to sort of educate the members uh, on, on the, the differences between who, what rules are more stringent versus versus a, say an, an elected official. Right. We try to uh, educate as much as possible. We just developed an online tool for members of parliament, which we, we give. Once you are elected, you first of all you get you get a training from us. We are asked to. to then there is an online tool which walks you through the various possible situations and, and issues and how to resolve them, etc. We don't have one yet for ministers or, <coughs> or 
reporting office holders, but we are in the process of developing that too. What we all, always think our business, the best way is obviously for people not to get into, into conflict of interest is to be informed, to know what it is, etc. That's why we also, for every single person who falls under the quota, we appoint somebody in our office. This is your contact. In view of any issues, talk it to that person, and that person is there to help you. And, and you can always do more, etc. It also depends on how much time people want to spend on it. You're all very busy people. You have a lot of other things to do, you know, and, and some of this is, is frankly speaking, <coughs> tedious. And some people say, I know this, I call it. Others, others is, is, very, is very peculiar and very, de, very new to people, etc. So to the extent that people are willing to, to learn and be educated, we provide as much as we can. Thank you, Commissioner. I'm going to share the rest of my time with uh, uh, Ms. Damoff. Okay. Go ahead. A uh, minute and 25 seconds, Ms. Damoff. Oh, longer than I thought. Um, Commissioner, I, I wonder if you could um, talk just briefly about how more rigorous the requirements are for ministers and parliamentary secretaries, not just on sponsored travel, but the, the actual form itself. Okay, I think my ex the expert on the form sits beside me, so Lynn. So, so essentially, um, I would say the forms are pretty much identical between the MP code and the Act. Why? Because we ask for information about assets, liabilities, investments, uh, companies, businesses. Um, we ask about outside activities under both regimes. Um, however, as the Commissioner ex explained, there are more stringent rules with regards to measures that reporting public office holders, including ministers, will have to uh, abide by versus uh, a member of parliament. So, so things like not holding, um, not owning stocks, you can own mutual funds. Um, not having, you, you can't be actively involved in a company. You can, you can still be part owner, but you have to put it in a blind trust, correct? Correct. So those are measures that, that are required under the Conflict of Interest right. Act so that reporting public office holders must divest of their controlled assets. Uh, they also must step down of any uh, business. So I, I only have a few seconds left, yeah, so I'm yeah, going to make yeah. a personal plea to yeah. the members of the Conservative Party Sorry. to not yeah, of, put of on social media you're out of time, Ms. to spam Damn. my Ms. office Damm. because I moved to adjourn debate. It is a personal plea to my colleagues. You're out of time, Ms. Damoff. Thank you. Uh, Monsieur Fortin. You have two and a half minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I believe that the topic was already covered, but I would like to come back to it anyway. I just want to be sure that I understand. Mr. Commissioner, you will be doing an additional verification of what was seen in articles this, this morning from the Globe and Mail, I believe. Is that correct? We will look at the facts and determine whether or not we'll need to carry out an investigation. And the motion proposed by the Conservatives, oh, we've adjourned debate, and I imagine we'll get back to that at a future meeting. And if that's the case, we would be interested to hear the results of the verifications you'll be doing. Do you know how much time it will take your office to get to the heart of the matter? Answer. It's quite difficult to give a timeline because I don't know the facts. If we determine that an investigation is needed, there's a process that will need to be followed. We'll have to notify the people who will be part of the investigation. We have two investigations on STDC. We started that three months ago and it should be done in August. And so something like this generally takes a few months. And so we wouldn't be able to ask you 
to share a report with us before June 20th, I guess. I doubt that that'll be possible, indeed. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I don't have any other questions, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Fortin. Mr. Commissioner. Uh, two and a half minutes. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Mr. Commissioner, pursuant to subsection 27.1 of the Conflict of Interest Act, public office holders must divest each of their controlled assets within 120 days after the day on which they were appointed as a public office holder. What does your office do to ensure that this divestment has taken place? As well, we uh, notify, we have contact with the real a registered public office holder and saying, you know, here was the following, let's assume as we had identified certain issues like that these things have to be put in blind trust. So we give them the, the information, or we will tell them we will pay for the lawyer, we will pay for the blind trust, but you have to up to this day to do it. And then if we do not get a, a response within a reasonable time, we will say, look, you already in, in day whatever X, and there's only this much time to so get on with it, get it done, etc. We remind them, we push them slightly. And, you know, people is, everybody's interested in complying. Nobody wants to be off-site the requirement okay. of the commission. If I, if I could, what about the 120 days during which a public office holder is still in possession of the controlled assets? Do public office holders have to take any temporary measures to avoid conflicts of interest during that period? Well, look, if, if they are controlled assets and you, if you have to dispose of them and, and, or put them in a blind trust, then obviously during that period of time you don't deal with them. I mean, it goes without saying, you have been appointed, we have we've identified these things, we say these are controlled assets that you are not entitled to hold. Get rid of them or put them in a blind trust. You're doing it. Then the end to, so to, if just if to, just during to that period of time clear. you would be acting with them, you would be acting in, essentially in bad okay. faith. And just, I just for the for the purpose of my very short time, it's your it's your testimony here today that the moment somebody is appointed as a public office holder, at that moment they then cease to be able to have any contact or control, despite the fact that there's a 120 day window. No, that's not what I said at all. What I said is, we, you have been appointed. We deal with you. We identify. You do your, your disclosure, and we identify a certain assets that you are not allowed to hold. So you have then the choice of selling them or put them in a the blind trust. The moment we tell you that, from that moment on, I don't think you you should you can deal with them because that's you, it has now been cleared. You know. They can't hold with this, and you can't deal with them. You have a, up to the end of the 120 days to either get rid of them or put them in a blind trust. Yet you're certainly not dealing with them in the meantime. So, if if there was a deal made during that time, that would be in contravention. Very quick. I, it has never happened, and I don't expect it to happen because you know why would you do that? You have just been told by my office. These are things you shouldn't own. Get rid of them and put them in plan. plan. If you're then dealing with them, surely you're not acting in good faith. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Green. Uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, Ms. Robinson Dalpe, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you for your appearance today and uh, appreciate the time that you've taken and, and always appreciate the expertise and the, uh, and the work that you do. Uh, and I wanted to say thank you uh, to your staff as well, uh, Mr. Commissioner. Okay, thank you. Okay, before we uh, conclude, I, uh, Mr. Baines uh, brought up an issue uh, at the beginning of the meeting regarding uh, the question of privilege. Just going to remind the committee as well that uh, it was, it's not up to the committee to determine uh, whether a question of privilege happened. It's whether it touches on a question of privilege. Um, there was a motion that was moved to report this to the House. The motion that was presented is debatable and amendable. Uh, we were uh, in the middle of the debate last time. The meeting was adjourned, uh, which therefore means that the debate of uh, the motion was adjourned as well. Uh, so there are several options, and uh, you know, obviously I'm going to seek uh, committee guidance on this. The first option is to, uh, that a member can move a motion to, the, uh, to continue debate when they have the floor at the next meeting, at which point the debate would resume if a majority of members decide to resume debate. The other option 
because the, pl the plan, frankly, was to try to get to this report uh, that uh, we have sitting, the consideration of the draft report on the data collection technological tools, because uh, I think it was the, uh, the will of the committee to have this presented before Parliament rises. We haven't even started that at this point. Uh, but I can, uh, I can certainly, we can certainly go in that direction, or we can uh, resume debate on the uh, on the uh, the motion that was presented to report this to the House. So I'm seeking some feedback from committee members on this, uh, where they want to go in the next meeting. Mr. Barrett, go ahead. Yeah, Chair, um, I I would like to proceed with the consideration of the draft report. Um, however, our last two meetings where we attempted to do that was unsuccessful. If the committee is going to be dealing with committee business, um, I would like to deal with the business that uh, Mr. Kirk put forward today and debate was adjourned on it and I think that there is interest from, um, from members to, to consider sure. that matter as well. So, uh, I, so, so if, we're, if we're just going to be uh, looking at business, uh, you know, what committee business we can be seized with, I think, you know, based on uh, the okay. bombshells that uh, that dropped today, I'd be very interested in, in pursuing debate of uh, Mr. Kirk. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm seeking guidance. I'm going to ask for quick interventions here because we do have 1.30 hard stop, Mr. Fisher, and then uh, Mr. Brock. Thank you very much, and I, I certainly don't want to speak for Mr. Baines, but uh, it was debated at length, mostly by the Conservatives. I'm sure that we could deal with it in 10 minutes, bring it to a vote, complete debate, and bring it to a vote, and we could get it before the House pretty darn quickly. Okay, thank you. Mr. Brock? On, on the, thank you. On the issue of committee business, uh, I don't want the committee to lose sight of the fact that we still need to have a discussion on what to do with the RCMP documents and the documents received from Mr. Warnock. Okay. That's been on our agenda for a couple of weeks now, and I'd like to get to that. Okay. All right. Uh, I appreciate the feedback. I'm going to take it back with the clerk. We're going to provide a, a notice of meeting uh, probably by the end of today. Uh, so I'm just going to seek some guidance from the clerk, okay? Um, that's all that I have for today. I want to uh, wish everybody a great day. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>